And now this evening, we're very lucky to have Esther Miriam Wagner talking to us on Arabic letters in the prize paper collections from Tuscany to Alexandria to the Levant, because this is really a window on one particular year, a ship captured by British privateers in 1759, and the letters that were found on it virtually untouched since that time. These prize collections are really extraordinary. There was a meeting about another one in Madrid uh, a few years ago, because they remain untouched since that date, since they were archived in the 18th century. They contain business letters sent between merchants in many different languages, and um, also between clergy as well as merchants. So Esther, who is the executive director of the Wolf Institute, who has done a doctorate on Judeo-Arabic letters at Cambridge and has published articles on this extraordinary find, is going to speak to us about it tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, and uh, thank you very much for all of you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I think originally we had planned this for spring 2020 or thereabouts. Um, so a few things happened in between, um, but finally, uh, two years later, I'm very, very pleased to be here, to have some live audience and also to see quite a few uh, people joining us online, which is really, really great. So I'll start this with a slight caveat. Um, I'm very conscious that I'm speaking at the Royal Asiatic Society as part of a uh, Levantine Heritage Foundation series, but much of the material that I will present on actually concerns matters in Egypt or it originates from Egypt. But I was assured earlier that anything east of Malta is the Levant, so I'm very, very pleased about that. And uh, of course, in the medieval and in the postmodern era, era, there's actually a very, very strong link between Egypt and the Levant, because uh, in, in during most times, for example, under the Tunisian stemming uh, Fatimids or under the Kurdish Ayyubids or under the Mamluks or the Ottomans, um, Egypt was actually part of the same country as uh, part of uh, West Asia. So uh, most of the things that I will mention and talk about today actually uh, may sort of be about Egypt or concern Egypt, but just hold as true for the Levant and for Western Asia. So, I want to start with a map of the Mediterranean. And uh, I mean, just talking to some of you uh, here, I am quite, quite familiar that sort of uh, preaching to the converted, uh, taking oaths to Athens, you will know about this, but I, I still think uh, I would like to emphasize this here. In the medieval and in the early modern period, um, the Mediterranean, this area around the sea was really one big continuum. So Sicily, for example, was once part of the Tunisian kingdom, or Spain belonged to an empire that stretched all around the southern Mediterranean, or Crete uh, belonged to Andalusia in the 9th and 10th century. And um, we all know that, of course, Turkey was part of the uh, Eastern Roman Empire in the Greek-speaking region. And in fact, of course, until the early 20th century, a lot of the coast, uh, the Levantine coast and uh, into Egypt still uh, had Greek-speaking communities. But nowadays, because of political alliances, uh, there's a very, very strong perception of a separation between the European and Asian and uh, North African parts uh, of the Mediterranean. Uh, very often when people think of the Middle East, they think about war, they think about corruption, terrorism, all these things come into people's minds. They think of broken political systems, for example, in Lebanon, of dysfunctional governments, of poverty. And of course, this all goes back to a very human trait that we tend to see the world through uh, the prism of our own time and through our own experiences. And because of this present time, it's very often dif difficult for people that I talk to uh, to imagine that the past was actually very, very different, that the Middle East was a really thriving place with a well-functioning economy, a place that was on the forefront of science, a place that had literature and arts, a sort of a pinnacle of literature, literature and art when much of, of Europe was actually in what we would perhaps call a cultural dark age. Um, when Europe was in a similar situation than parts of uh, the Middle East are now, if you think about, for example, the 30-year war, which cost up to a third 
of the population uh, uh, lives at the time, depending on the region. And much of the separation now that we have between Europe, the European Mediterranean and the, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, of course, has to do with religion. So we have Christianity in Europe and we have Islam in the Middle East. But until the 20th century, communities in the Eastern Mediterranean especially were a lot more heterodox. Um, we had Muslims living in Greece. We had Christians, a lot of Christians living in the Levant and in Egypt. We had Jews and, uh, and Christians living in uh, Iraq. So before the 20th century, a lot of this was a really multi-religious, multi-ethnic societies where people of different Abrahamic faiths especially lived together, not without problems, obviously, but without the problems that were quite common in Europe. There were no expulsions, there were no pogroms. Uh, we really have to remember that people lived together there for 1,300 years, uh, a shared history that is, I think, not found anywhere in Europe, really. So, and when we look at the, um, at the situation on the ground in terms of uh, diversity, language is actually a really good indicator. So, in Europe, because of pre-nationalist thought and because of nationalist thought, um, we created a particular homogeneity of states. Uh, we created states that really followed the credo as one language, one religion, uh, 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 one nation. And this wasn't so much the case in, in, in the East. So if you look at this map here, which I brought sort of has parts of it, uh, Turkey and Iraq, because that's the focus of the person who made the map. Um, but of course, much of it also holds true for sort of the areas more in the West. But you see that there are various different uh, language families and many, many different languages spoken in very, very close proximities. You have all these very sort of different villages next to each other speaking completely different uh, uh, language in, sort of in languages from completely different language families. Uh, this is map uh, is courtesy of Jeffrey Kahn, professor of Hebrew at the University of Cambridge. So this really, the, the linguistic map I think here gives you a really, really good impression of what diversity, ethnic diversity and religious diversity would have been uh, 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 in, on the ground in the area. And I think this also should be a reminder for ourselves that what we've had in the last two centuries in Europe, or three centuries perhaps, um, is really not the natural order of things. It's uh, not naturally the way how societies need to function. Um, so the, uh, the way, of course, then to explore this is to, to look into the past, especially in the Middle East. And how do we ideally learn? Uh, from the past or about the past. We can learn from historiographical sources, so we can read the historians. Um, but in the last two or three decades, I think historians have really turned to another source, and that's documents. So we are much, much more interested now in documentary history because it's free of biases, it's free of agendas. Um, people who wrote documents typically didn't think that hundreds of years later someone would start reading their materials. So um, I'm always really, really aware of this, that when I read a letter, there's sort of very, very intimate secrets in them and someone talks about adultery in the family or about a daughter being beaten by the husband. I always wonder what they would think if they knew that, you know, a few hundred years later, I'm reading this secret and I'm sort of putting it down in an article. So that's something that always plays out a little bit in my mind. So this shift from historians, you all have heard the saying, of course, that history is written by the winner, um, at two historic, uh, to historical documents, of course, is also tied in with this whole deconstructivist uh, approach to history. So we don't have this idea anymore. A lot of historians don't have this idea anymore that there is just one agreed version of history, but there are many, many different versions depend depending on the perspectives of the individuals experiencing it. So naturally, growing up in this environment, in academe, um, I am very, very interested in documents, in letters, in registers. Um, and what I really love about it is that it preserves voices that you don't normally hear about. So for example, this is a letter from the Geniza Collection. I'll tell you what the Geniza Collection is for those of you who don't know. 
uh, in, in a few minutes. This is a letter from a Geniza collection where a teacher writes to a parent. And it says, you should know my master, my, my lord, that um, and, and sort of all sorts of pious blessings, that your son actually didn't break his writing tablet. The other boys in the class broke the, broke the writing tablet. So don't punish him. It wasn't his fault. So obviously you have a little boy here who's in the class, who's being bullied. He's probably a bit precocious. He knows things. The other boys bully him and break his writing tablet. It's almost like an American high school sort of nerd versus jock uh, uh, play out. But to learn about this 700 years later from a, from a little note like this is really, really special. And it, it really shows how amazing it is to delve into these sources from the ground and this sort of this history from below. So I've mentioned the Geniza connection now. I'm very conscious again, my talk is about the price papers and I will get there in the end, but I'm also a Geniza scholar and the Geniza is very close to my heart. And I had a conversation earlier where someone didn't know the Cairo Geniza. So I'll use this opportunity uh, to introduce this most amazing source. So what we call the Cairo Geniza are basically 350,000 pieces of writing that were found in a synagogue in Cairo, or in Old Cairo, in Fustat. And they were deposited there for over the course of a thousand years, basically, or 900 years, 900 years, um, because according to Jewish belief, you can't throw anything away that contains the name of God. You can't throw it away, you can't burn it. You have to either ritually bury it or you have to store it. And this was one of those storerooms, and basically, people over 900 years kept depositing layer upon layer uh, of writing. This is what it looked like when it came out uh, 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 into this room. And then it was taken out at the end of the 19th century, basically these 900 years of history. And you will see that the script, if, for those of you who know languages, the script looks Hebrew, but actually most of those sources would have been Arabic. They're written in Hebrew script, but it's actually Arabic language written in Hebrew script, which we call today Arabic. And what I've been doing is I've been using the Geniza um, as a backdrop and as a sort of explanatory depository uh, when I talk about the price paper. And that's because the collection I'm talking about, the Arabic price papers, is actually just 55 letters. They're very, very precious, and I'll talk about why they're so precious. But of course, because it's a relatively um, sort of small corpus, it's really, really exciting to uh, have other materials to bolster, you know, sort of any claims I might make. So um, I will always compare them to these 350,000 fragments that we have from the Cairo Geniza. And now I'm coming to the price papers themselves. So the, the price papers um, are, the, are stored in the National Archives in Kew Garden. And they are really a very, very special source. I know some of you, Philip was already talking about them uh, earlier. Uh, some of you know about them. Um, the reason why the prize papers are in the National Archives is that uh, in the 17th, 18th, early 19th century, the navies and also private ships in Britain competed over uh, spoiling, uh, or sort of finding spoils of war in the various seas. So basically, it's state-sanctioned piracy. Navy ships and also private ships would go out uh, onto the seas. They would detect enemy ships. So ships that were in the sort of sailing under the flag of one of the countries that uh, Britain was in war with. And they would then take over the ship, take the wares. But most importantly, whenever they did this, in order to prove that they had really legitimately taken enemy wares, they had to take all the papers that were found on the ship and they had to lock them with the Admiralty Court. And then there would be a price paper investigation. People would establish that the wares that had been confiscated were indeed enemy wares or not. Uh, and then they could either keep them or in theory, if, if there weren't enemy wares, they would have to give them back. I don't think that happened very often. It was very difficult. I mean, in the materials I've seen, it's very, very difficult for people to claim uh, a back uh, unjustified uh, sort of the seizure of cargo. So the ships that were seized were most often during those 300 years, uh, Dutch ships, Spanish ships, French ships, and most of the price papers and the thousands and thousands of price papers uh, are written in Dutch or French or Spanish or in other languages. And there are, again, I, 
absolutely astounding source of knowledge because we he, there's all sorts of um, correspondence that can be found in the price papers, not just mercantile, but uh, other materials as well, which really you know, sort of tell you all about the social and mercantile activities at the time. So it's a real, real treasure trove. Um, they have only been discovered in the last decades or so. They lay relatively forgotten uh, in, the, in the National Archives until with this sort of rise in documentary history, with this interest in history from below, people discovered them and then it, it's really, really taken off in the last years. Uh, dozens or maybe even hundreds of researchers have started to work on these price papers. And um, I think maybe five years ago, so it must have been five, six years ago, um, a conference was organized at the National Archives in Kew Gardens to call together researchers write, uh, writing and researching on the price papers. And I was invited as a person from a related field. So uh, because I work on Geniza and I, because I work on letters from roughly the same period, so 18th, 19th century from the Geniza, I was invited to go there and, and talk about my materials. And um, then something special happened to me. Basically, I was approached after my talk, very nicely received that I had a lot of really interesting questions and, and suggestions. This person called Dr. Thomas Truxus, he, he joined me, he said, can I show you something? I've just found something. And then he showed me this, this picture here. And it was a bit like, um, you know, when people went into the Tutankhamun uh, chamber and found this amazing thing, I was like, my heart leapt because there's really, really very little material um, that Arabists like me can work on from the time. And um, so I took down, the, uh, well, I took the photo, I uh, booked myself onto a train to London and I went to the National Archives to, to check this out. So it was again this, this very serendipitous moment that led to me starting to work on this. And when I got there into the uh, National Archives, um, I found out all, all sorts of things. For example, I found out that uh, the ship they were uh, on, which was called the Bartolomeo Prato, the captain of the ship was Luig Luigi Gonzaga, and his ship had been intending to sail from Livorno towards Alexandria. And uh, the year in which all these letters were found was 1759, as Philip mentioned. And of course, uh, this is the year Britain became master of the world. Uh, so I thought that was actually quite a, 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 an interesting year to, to research as well. So when I went to the archives, um, I basically found uh, these bundles of letters. There were in total, there were 55 letters and registers uh, and all sorts of things. I think overall it's about 80 documents, but I think 55 distinct letters. And as Philip said, they were really untouched when I arrived there. Most of the envelopes were still sealed. So it was really, really exciting to have the librarian open these things for me. And then when they opened, you really had this glistening ink. You could see that the ink was sort of absolutely, you know, perfect condition, pure. I'd never seen anything like it. It then sort of started dis disintegrating and I was a bit worried that they would take the materials away from me. Um, but they, yeah, when they were opened, they just, they were an absolutely astonishing color. Um, and um, so most of the local le letters looked like this. Others had been opened because of the inquiry, because obviously there had been an inquiry at some point where people established these wares had been uh, enemy wares, even though it was really contested because they weren't technically enemy wares. Um, but uh, uh, the outcome of that uh, wasn't recorded there. So the, the, this is what they look, out, uh, look like when they're open. The letters uh, that we had there consist of two different kinds of correspondence. On the one hand, we have, as I said, merchant letters. There's a lot of, um, uh, sort of a big trade network that deals in wool, in leather, in cotton, in flax, and coffee, but also other things, like safflower, uh, cochineal, so it's a, a beetle that uh, produces the red dye, which was the main source of red uh, dye at the time, uh, pewter, and uh, the trade would go, both, would go both ways. So wool would be shipped from Europe into Egypt and into Asia, and then safflower or uh, leather uh, or coffee would come back the other way. 
So the majority of the writers of these letters here are Christians, and that's why that's why I got so very excited about this because um, I'm a sociolinguist by training, so I get very very interested in the linguistic differences between the different communities when they write, when they speak, um, and there aren't really any other Christian corpora at least published or available uh, to me. So that's why I, I was very very excited about this. Um, but it's not just Christians that are being mentioned. They are part of a very multi-faith network. There are letters to Muslims, there are letters to Jews. So it really gives this really nice impression of, of this network, that we, this mercantile network that we have active in 1759. And of course, these networks aren't new in the 18th century. They had been in place for many hundreds of years. There has been a really long ebb and flow of mercantile activity, in particular in Egypt and in the, uh, in the sort of um, what is now the Holy Land, uh, Lebanon and Syria. Uh, and this started in the 11th century with these big networks that were operating out of Egypt under the Fatimids. They were really dominating the Mediterranean trade. And then it changed slightly in the 12th century, the Italian city-states started really pushing into the uh, into mercantile activities uh, and sort of the Egyptians had to withdraw there. They were then sort of um, trading towards the, the southern east or towards Yemen and towards India, uh, while the Italians became very dominant, uh, Genoese, uh, Venetians. I mean, you, you, you probably, hang on, where's my Galata? Yeah, so Galata Tower, you, you will know these, uh, you will know this. Someone just uh, showed around the book of Istanbul. This is the Galata Tower in, uh, in Istanbul. I mean, these presences, the Italian presences that, um, that were established everywhere. So most of the letters will look like this one here, but there are also others which look, if you know Arabic, which look a bit more rude. And um, I don't think it's necessarily crude writing. I think there's actually some interference in letters like this. There are quite a few that look like this. And I think that there is a bit of Syriac influence there. Those are people who, are, uh, who grow up to write Syriac first, and then they uh, become Arabic writing. And um, this is something that I know from the Geniza very well, because uh, in our Geniza sources, we learn that um, pretty much every male Jewish boy in the 11th century, for example, would have been taught to read. So we have a literacy rate that is sort of exorbitantly high, 95% of all boys and even girls were um, educated. We know that because we have the community records where orphan girls have their school fees paid for by the community. So we know that um, learning at least to read is something that's really prized. Um, and we know that similar things happened in other minority communities, such as um, Christian uh, Syria communities. So I talked to someone who works with uh, who works on this, and he basically told me that the processes are exactly the same as in the Jewish community. So in the Jewish community, you would learn to read first Hebrew and Hebrew script, and you would learn to read Arabic and Hebrew script, and in the end, you would learn how to read Arabic and Arabic script. And apparently, it's the same in Syriac. You first learn Syriac and Syriac script, then Arabic and Syriac script, and in the end, Arabic and Arabic script. So when you have a product like this, this could well be the product of uh, an education system where you basically learn a different alphabet and a different language first, and then you switch to another. And that's also, you can see this in some of the, um, the, the linguistic features because there's definitely a, a Syrian uh, influence or event influence in the Arabic. So as I said, we have two different kinds of correspondence. We have uh, traders' letters, we have um, uh, this, you know, all sorts of uh, 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 correspondence that pertain to mercantile activity, including registers, ship registers. Um, but we also have other letters. We have letters um, that are sent by clergy in Rome to co-religionists in Egypt and in Levant. And these letters mostly deal with a relay of information between the different churches, or they deal with um, uh, uh, sort of mercantile letters in a, in a clerical context, so dealing of books or dealing of icons and, and sort of pictures uh, and things like that. And uh, the letters also show this very close connection between uh, the traders and the clergymen. 
um, they really, really trust one another. So in one of the letters, of a priest called Raphael, and I will talk about Raphael in a second, he makes it really clear that he trusts one of the main traders we have. We have about 15 letters by a certain guy called Joseph Bakti. And um, he really talks about how he trusts this guy and that all the correspondence should be sent via this particular traders because he's a very trustworthy merchant. Um, because from the hands of those mentioned, we have received many letters safely and they were sent to us, whatever you give to them. So there's a real trust between the clergy and those merchants. And this is something that is expressed in many, many letters. So as I already said, the, the price papers are really, really exciting on many, many levels, um, both historical, linguistic, but also material culture. Um, so from a linguistic point of view, the, the fact that there's very, very little other comparative material available makes them, makes them a really, really precious source. Uh, they really fill our gap of understanding of how Christians in the period would write and how they would um, sort of frame the linguistic continuum of their own networks. Um, the historical importance is that they enable us really to gain very precious insights into the interaction between the different merchants from different faith communities across the borders, so from Egypt to the Levant, and then also into Italy. And we also learn about the relations between the different uh, sort of Christian institutions uh, around the Mediterranean. And the material aspect, the material culture aspect is, as I already said, the, the fact that we actually have completely closed letters, which is something extremely precious because normally when we have archival materials, the letters are obviously open. No one bothers to keep an envelope in, a, in an archive. So this was working on the um, on the price papers, but the first time I actually had a proper letter in my hand, and I could see how it's folded and I could see how it's sealed, which was something that was completely obscure to me before because I've always just worked on big letters, opened letters that had been handled that then had been filed somewhere. So this was really really revelatory. I'm just checking time, so go on too long. Um, so. Coming back to historical content, uh, I've talked about the, the mercantile correspondence, but I also want to explain a little bit more about the background of the clerical materials. And this is um, heavily uh, borrowing from the work of Alberto Winterberg, what I'm going to say. So the Coptic church emerged in the aftermath of the Council of Chalcedon, which was this big split between the different churches. Uh, and the split was um, also due to the fact that there are uh, uh, two different factions in theological doctrine. So you have the monophysites, which are part of the, so the Coptic um, churches believe that there is uh, only one Christ, one single human divine nature person, whereas the Deophysites, which are the Romans and the Byzantines, uh, they define Christ as a being in possession of two human and divine natures. So this caused a, a really, really big split uh, between the churches, um, it forced basically a presence of two churches in Egypt because the, the Byzantines introduced the Greek Orthodox Church in Egypt, the Diophysite uh, Church, as opposed to the liturgical Monophysite Coptics. And um, there, sort of, there was struggle between the two churches until the, the Arabs invaded uh, Egypt and basically pushed the uh, momentum towards the Copts because um, the Greek church was associated with Byzantium, which was a political enemy. So by the 17th century, there was a bit of a dawn of a new policy in Rome towards dealing with Christians in the East. I mean, it's sort of early colonialism, early expansionism. And they started to begin to, begin to establish themselves as a presence in Egypt. And they started to focus on conversion of Egyptian Christians rather than unification with Copts. And to do this, they basically tried to find suitable candidates who would come from Egypt to Rome to give them in Rome a doctrinal education and missionary training. And, and this would happen at the newly established uh, Collegio Urbano. 
And it was actually not easy for people to find uh, candidates because there were very, very few people who were willing to actually make this move from Egypt to, uh, to Europe. Um, as a certain scholar called Hamilton, he says that there was a profound sense of family feeling which characterized Egyptian society, which would have prevented them from, from leaving the family. Um, Coptic parents hoped that their children looked after them in old age. So if you let your children go, of course, you would lose someone to provide for you in old age. And there was also this, this, this really sort of deep reluctance to let your children move across the sea. I mean, this is something that's shared in many cultures. I know that, for example, in India, uh, people who crossed the sea lost their caste, right? They, they lost their caste belonging because it was something that was just not done if you crossed an ocean. But they found some people they, who were willing to come to, uh, to uh, Italy and to be trained as priests. And one of them was this priest, Raphael, or not, not the priest then, but this boy, Raphael, he was a bit of a rebellious person. He was born in, in 1700 in the upper Egyptian, Egyptian town of Gerga. And um, he, I mean, there are really, really nice uh, descriptions of him in, in various historians. He's quite a famous person. Um, and again, in this amazing twist, these few prize papers we have from this random ship actually contain letters of this Raphael Tuchel, who's quite a famous Coptic person. And again, this is not something that is um, unique to the price papers. We have a very similar thing in, uh, in the Geniza, where you really find the writings of the celebrities of the time. So for example, the Geniza contains the original uh, works, many of the original works of the famous Maimonides. We have letters by Maimonides, but we also have all sorts of treatises. We have a, a, a medical works by Maimonides. Um, and similarly, we have uh, works of the famous Judah Halevi. So somehow, famous people's works, even at the time, managed to find their ways into the archive. But of course, in the case of the Price Papers, it's even more astonishing because we have this random lot, and then one of the people in this random lot is actually quite a famous Coptic person who's a priest, uh, who was uh, consecrated as a priest in, in Rome in 1735. He dedicated his life to being a scholar, he was the first Egyptian to receive a doctoral degree of theology in Rome. Uh, and then he basically uh, was even ordained as a bishop by Pope Clement XIII in 761. He died in Rome in 87, so he lived a very long life and he was buried at the Vatican. So we have this extraordinary person basically featuring in our letters. Uh, I was talking about material culture earlier. Uh, this is also something really, really nice in the price papers. We actually have a sample of where. So this person here writes, um, can you please send me more of this, this sort of copper wire? And then he sends exactly what sort of copper wire he has, he would, would like to have. So he sends the sample here uh, uh, as, a, as, a, um, as, a, as a demand to his partner, which is, which is just extraordinary. I'm looking at the time again. Have another 10 minutes. Um, so I thought maybe in the end I'll, um, yeah, so this is Raphael Tuhri, this is one of his letters um, that he wrote. Um, he has a very, very neat handwriting, so even if you, you know, like me, you're not that good in reading Arabic, sort of difficult handwriting, this is something that even I can very easily read. So he's my favorite, he's a good boy. Um, yes, yeah, so perhaps I thought in the minutes left, we could um, delve into some of the very interesting aspects that are highlighted in the letters. And again, I want to refer some of it to Geniza materials. So what becomes quite apparent is that people here are not necessarily writing themselves, but they're using scribes. Um, the signature here that is below is a different person signing it, sending greetings, sending his name, than the person writing the letter. And this is a very, very common phenomenon in, in the Geniza. In, for mercantile activities at the time, because often you try to send copies of letters in five different ships. So not one person could write very quickly. You have to react quickly. You couldn't write long letters like this in five copies all by yourself. Um, also, there's something about using a scribe. A higher merchants would not write themselves, obviously. It's something that you, you do, let, let someone do who is, um, you know, your inferior. Um, and this is, yeah, this is shared a sort of shared heritage all over the, the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, 
These are very, very nice copies we have in the Geniza of a letter that was written by a community leader, by a Jewish community leader. It's a, it's a, it's a Judeo-Arabic letter. And then on the left side, you have the slightly nicer copy of a scribe. And the scribe basically um, removes all spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes. And uh, he also removes some sort of angry comments that are in the original letter. So it's sort of the smooth copy, which is much nicer, which again tells you, you know, even um, documents can't necessarily be trusted. So the original is the one on the right where, you know, the person really has a go at someone. And then the nice, the nice sort of nice and up copy is the one on the left by the scribe. But in the scribe is the one who sets the linguistic standards as well. The, the one on the right is the one who writes it, uh, sort of, you know, what we wouldn't call sort of proper English. Um, a very, very common theme that we find in the letter is, um, and it's also very common in all, in all letters I've ever read, especially Geniza letters, is the, the complaint about the lack of letters and the complaint about the lack of affection. So we have this one very nice letter where it said, in particular, you sent me your news to the monastery, oh, sorry, in particular, as you sent your news to the monastery of our father Pahomius, and the thought never entered your minds to update us with your news, as if you had forgotten about us entirely, it is as if, the love, as if the love between us had been lost in this way. So that with all effort and hard work possible for me, I was not able to restore it again. Not only that, but I cannot even see one carrot of the love and friendship that I used to enjoy. Indeed, that is not expected between friends. Without saying more, you're able to judge the situation better than me. Thus now you should think about everything that happened. I do not want to ask you about the reason for this loss and the delay for your reply. Very, very heartfelt uh, complaint about uh, not receiving uh, uh, information sent uh, uh, to other people uh, of the same order, but not to him. But that's also often sort of self-criticism. Here, this person, another writer, apologizes for not using quite the right style. He says, you informed us that we are always sending to you harsh letters and rude words. You did not want to reply to us with cruel letters. This is our brothers, indeed a, a grace from you that you didn't reply. Indeed, I do remember which bitter words I wrote to you because I was angry. From now onwards, I will not send you rude words ever again. What you think is appropriate, do it. You should be responsible for your business as I am for mine. The misfortune and the loss is on us. In any case, we keep on pursuing our profit. Very, very important theme in the, in the letters. And then there's another letter, which is really, really quite interesting because the information there, sort of given there, reveals so much about the background of how young people from Egypt would be sent to Italy to be trained uh, and in the mercantile activity. There's a particular person who sent his son, so the person who, to whom the letter is addressed sent his son to Italy, and uh, things didn't go very well. So he is sent this letter concerning your son Ibrahim. We are treating him with mercy and we are making efforts in what helps his soul and his body for the sake of the family and for yourselves. We are acting patiently as much as we can. We're telling ourselves when he makes a mistake, it's not a problem because he's still a young boy and he does not understand. Gradually, he will get used to grasp this and he will understand his mistakes and come to understand. However, what we see is that his heart is passionate and the arrogance and self-conceit are in his blood. This attribute comes from his mother's side. The mother is Egyptian. It will never change. He makes me miserable. How many times I ordered him to stop this? He can only take leave when I know where he's going and with whom, according to the mandatory rules. But this did not work with him because of his arrogance and his lack of humility. If I let, let it happen once, he would do it 10 times and 10 times will become 100 times. Especially in this country, which is a free country. So there's a real complaint about Italy and Italian youth in there. My intention is that I'm exhausted with the kid because of his lack of obedience. We find that his case is hopeless because God dislikes the arrogant. My effort to guide him are worthless and the Egyptian descendants have no worth and they are hopeless. So there's a bit of a turn. In the beginning, there's some hope in the text. So he says, you know, well, 
um, you know, he will get used to this, but in the end, he, he sort of uh, talks himself into a rage uh, and he gets very, very upset. Again? Okay, I think I'll have maybe. Uh, but very quickly, there's also a lot of talk about the trade of books and of manuscripts. So we hear about uh, Coptic books that are being sent, sort of nice manuscripts are being sent from the Middle East to Italy and then sort of they sent back uh, uh, printed books, which doesn't sound like a terrible good trade in modern eyes, but probably it was a trade that worked those ways at the time. And we also hear about illness, we hear about how uh, someone with a kidney stone, who probably has a kidney stone, is being sent to Italy for uh, treatment and um, the, uh, basically sort of uh, treating him uh, uh, in all sorts of ways uh, to make him, make him better. So we have a uh, health tourism uh, in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, and I think I, I want to wrap this up by talking a little bit about um, my own field, which is sociolinguistics. And I don't think we have too many Arabic uh, people here. So Arabic um, people, so speaking or Arabic writing people. So I'll just keep it very, very general. What's really intriguing about the letters is that um, Christians use much more colloquial language than they write to their fellow Christians than when they write to Muslims. So just to demonstrate this, in yellow basically is the marking of vernacular language. I mean, you, see a Christian to a Muslim, uh, writing to a Muslim, it's this vernacular elements are kept to a, to a minimum, but when a Christian writes to a Christian, it's much, much more colloquial. And the reason for that is that there is a community feeling, right? People, when they write to fellow Christians, they will use a language which is much, much more warm and hence vernacular. Um, so that's something that, that uh, is one of the big results uh, in terms of linguistics. Um, writers start to write more colloquial language when they get angry, which is very, very nice. So um, uh, they will basically uh, uh, express s s sort of an angry statement will often have um, much, much more colloquial elements in it. Uh, I will not read this, uh, but in case some of you can read uh, Arabic, you can, you can see the colloquial elements in this. Um, uh, because this person is quite angry because he doesn't know whether he's making a loss or a profit. And the third thing is that clerics would write in a different register than merchants. I mean, it's something that is expected, but the way they do it is quite interesting because they actually almost invent a new uh, uh, sort of language for themselves, which sounds elevated, but it's actually not what would be called uh, elevated language in, in other contexts. So those of you who know Arabic, they, they can probably see that there are some really interesting forms in there. Um, I hope that I've been given, I've given you a good uh, introduction to the uh, Christ Paper Collection to sh uh, show you that it's really a, a unique um, opportunity to study documentary Christian Ottoman Arabic. Um, they open up a wealth of material historically, uh, linguistically, uh, and also material uh, culture uh, sort of understanding. And um, yes, if you have any questions, um, I'm open. And I'm very Germanic, so I timed this exactly for 45 as I was instructed. I would like to point that out. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk, a real eye opener on the, the correspondence crossing the Mediterranean. My first question is obviously, there was frequent letters being exchanged, and this is Livorno to Alexandria, is it? Yes. Yeah. And then sent on onto sort of monasteries that are in what would now be so sort of Syria. And then you, we saw the envelopes. How did when the letters arrive in the ship in Alexandria? How did the letters then get to the destination? Yes. So basically, um, open this again and show you. How did I know a letter had arrived for me? Yes. <laughs> so. Right, okay, approach the envelopes. So the envelopes would have basically the name on it. No. No. Yes, so the envelopes would have the name on it. 
So it should arrive to you know, a particular person. So this is always with the help of God. Uh, and then you know, this letter should arrive to a particular person uh, who is there and there. But the, the information there wouldn't be enough for a current postal system. So it really, um, you can see it here in English, actually. Oh, that's not very Italian. Um, so it's, it's just the, 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 the merchant's name. He's in Alexandria. So he picks up this big pack, which contains all these small letters. He will know all these people. And then oh, in I the see. internal Eastern postal system, he will send them all. So even when he sends something to Turkey, so a lot of those letters, the letters go actually to Turkey, but he wouldn't send it directly from Italy to Turkey. That wouldn't work. He would have to send it down to Egypt, and then they go all the way up to Turkey again in order to reach their destination safely. But that's sort of the old postal system playing out like that. And sometimes you have, you know, you have little stars. I mean, some of these uh, recipients will be Jewish, so there's a little Jewish star uh, to indicate that this is a Jewish person. Um, and, but all these people would have been known entities. I mean, the whole, the whole mercantile system is very different from ours. Everything built is, is built on trust. If you lose if you lose your reputation, you're done. I mean, when we read about these people in the 18th century when someone goes bankrupt and they, they kill themselves, they kill themselves with a reason because once you've lost your reputation, there's no way, like nowadays, you just rebuild yourself. You're done. There's no way that you will be able to get back into the mercantile community. Um, so reputation and standing in the community is everything, and these merchants wouldn't risk you know, their, their, their livelihood for dodgy dealings, I suppose, with these, these, these uh, dodgy men. This one, a, a Jewish person send it to a Muslim person. So, I mean, this one, <laughs> because, because I can read, I, yeah, yeah. I can read Arabic. Yeah, yeah. So he sent it, he said, uh, this, this so, letter will... Yeah, this is a yeah, this letter will yeah. arrive to Scandal and yeah, yeah. yeah. to the hand yeah. of RC yeah. Hajj Mahmoud, which is yeah. a, a Muslim person. Yes, Hajj, you can see as Hajj 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 Mahmoud, definitely is a Muslim man, yes. 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 but probably Jewish. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's really, the, the presidents are so amazing because they see that there are just no barriers between the communities once you enter the um, the, the commercial arena, right? Because it's something that is for the for the uh, benefit of everyone. Yeah. I'm pleased that there's one Arabic reading of Arabic reader. Yes. Yes. So you, I hope you appreciated the lamp fee in these yes. sort of forms. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes it's not this, but the translation was wrong in grammar. Oh. <laughs> don't yes. they put it the didn't? Yes. They, yeah. No, no. Yeah. The the lamb is not yeah, the other one. Yeah, yeah. Lamb is not the not the past in those letters. They but actually lamb, use lamb for everything. Lamb means did not. No, no. In in classical Arabic it does. Yes, yes. But in in the language of these guys, because they use lamb as a as the only negation particle. They, so they have no la. They have no ma. Yeah. They always say lamb as ma. But not these yeah. guys. They really not like to yeah. use lamb for yeah. acting. So they have yeah. lamb fee. You have yeah. it's not in there, right? Yeah. Things like that. Lamb fee doesn't yeah. make sense in Arabic. Yes. Yeah. So the yeah. the past perfect for lamb is actually abandoned. Yeah. They just use it for anything. Yes. Yeah. 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 So this is the old. Yeah. 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 Are there any questions online? Mm -hmm. We had one which I think was referring to an, uh, an earlier point. Uh, where in Tuscany were these young people being sent? So, um, the, the merchants were mainly stationed in Livorno, but the clergy are in Rome. I don't know why I'm looking at you. The clergy are stationed in Rome, so you have um, the merchants in Tuscany, and actually the, the mercantile correspondence dates from a few weeks after the uh, clerical correspondence, because that was sent from Rome to Livorno, which took a bit of time, and then that was sent on. So there's basically this, yeah, the split. The, 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 the clergy wouldn't be in, in Livorno, they would be in Rome. In Livorno, what's the remorse? I don't know. We haven't got that far yet. So I have, I've read, a, I've read someone's book on it, and it talks about the Jewish community. There's actually, there's obviously a synagogue, but I haven't been able to establish yet whether that's a mosque. Actually, if anyone knows. Where, where was that? In Livorno. It was a free port. 
Yeah. Yes, it was a free port city. So there's definitely a big Jewish presence there. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure about the mosques. Uh, books. Did you find evidence from these letters? Did people in Alexandria know Italian? I think they did. I think they did because, I mean, it's at least, common. yes, I mean, the, I mean, obviously it's difficult to say because we don't have the, the batch of letters back, but by the fact that there's Italian letters in there, there's an Italian letter in there by, um, by our Raphael as well. So the, the cop that I was talking about, he writes an Italian letter to someone in, uh, in Egypt, in Alexandria, which makes me think that maybe he didn't want people to understand so it might be Italian, writing Italian might be a way to disguise information, which means that not everyone would have known Italian as well as Arabic. But there's also the fact that he wrote an Italian letter to Alexandria. Yes, there's so many Italian words in Alexandrian Arabic. Yes, that's very, very that's very true. It's this great um, these port cities. They are amazing in the sense that they they basically take vocabulary from all sorts of. Uh, uh, trading nations. And Alexandria was a, a very different case from Cairo. So Alexandria, for example, had bars, right? People would actually be able to drink in a bar, which would be completely oh, really? banned in, in Cairo. In the 18th century? Uh, not, I'm not sure about the 18th century, but you definitely have it in the 15th and 16th century. So, yes. Yes, I, I, I wouldn't be able to dig out the reference, but there is there's definitely a talk about um, bars being run in Alexandria, whereas in Cairo that would be absolutely forbidden. All Arab countries, even in Iran, have in Syria, they're living in bars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Do we get any ideas from the letters? Um, how uh, some of the Greece Christian trading networks could have supported church activities, building churches, facilitating links between yes. communities and clerics. Yes, we don't have any sort of donate. It's unlucky because normally we get this sort of information in the Geniza, we get these from these big donation lists where you have all the, exactly. you will have someone like um, use of the trader gives, I mean, five dirham or dinars to the to the mosque uh, to the synagogue. Unfortunately, because we don't have that sort of material, we can only conjecture. conjecture but obviously, they are helping to trade in the closure of books. They're helping in sort of trade of icons. There's some talk about paintings being traded. So there are really close links. I mean, I would imagine that there would be substantial donations. I mean, otherwise it would be quite unnatural because we see this in the in the Jewish community of Alexandria, how much money is being given, the sort of private money is being given to the, to, the, to the synagogues because that's the only way for them to sustain themselves. And we have a couple more comments or questions on Zoom. Um, was there intermarriage between the different mercantile communities or did they always marry within their own religious traditions? Yes, again, because of the limited nature of the price papers, I'll have to jump back to the Geniza and there I can give you a definite answer. Um, it would be very, very frowned upon. Um, it would not be really possible. There's a really interesting Geniza document where there is a Christian doctor who is meeting up with a Jewish young lady and it's the Muslim community who write, sort of the Muslim representatives who write to community elders on both sides and said, you have to stop this. These people can't mingle. Um, so there's always an effort to, um, to stop this sort of thing. On the other hand, it's slightly easier um, when people convert. So we have a Geniza example where Christian ladies want to convert to Judaism because they think that it would be easier to find a husband in the Jewish community. So that's something that, that happens as well. Um, there's also very interesting intermarriages between sort of when slaves are being married, sort of when slaves are being freed and then married to their former masters. So that's an area where it's possible because slaves aren't really allowed to be converted to any other religion. So in theory, you would have an interfaith marriage there, but again, in practice, often there's actually conversion even though it's not, it's not permitted necessarily. Um, what other sort of interesting, I mean, people really 
our intent on keeping up communal boundaries. So the millet system is really, the, the Ottoman system is really meant to make sure that there are barriers between the communities. So one of the few areas of interactions are sort of mercantile activities, but it doesn't quite, it, it spreads in a way to social activities. So in the Geniza we see that Jewish merchants would go into the house of Muslim merchants to wish them a nice Ramadan. It was just a thing you would do. It would be a courtesy to uh, congratulate each other on holidays, but you would not be able to marry one another. It's just not happening. Yeah. Yes, you mentioned um, the exchange of manuscripts or printed books from yes. Italy. So I was wondering two things. Number one, did the manuscripts, have the manuscripts returned? Um, uh, or were they, did they end up staying in Italian libraries? And also, what were the, do you know what the printing presses were that were able to, um, yeah, print these books? Yeah, unfortunately, I, don't, I mean, they must have been able to print, print Coptic, otherwise they wouldn't send these printed uh, Coptic books back. Um, and of course, the printed, the printing press was not really introduced into the Ottoman Empire until very, very late. It was something that wasn't allowed. Um, Previously. So these books were probably very, very grateful for the printed books. I mean, I assume that the manuscripts were the forelag for printing, so they imported the books maybe also to study. Because it was really interesting, um, Raphael Tufi, he was convinced to become a Catholic priest because he his sort of research for him showed that Coptic actually hadn't been modified. He actually thought that the Coptic Church should have been diophysite. So he was a rebel within that church, and I think maybe used the books also for his own sort of research to, to show how the Coptic Church was actually a Catholic church. And he converted quite a few Coptic people to Catholicism as well. So there may have been a means for him to, to, to sort of missionize. How does that answer the question? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, because we don't have the answers and because we don't have. Um, you know, it's, it's a snapshot, so we, we can always just sort of try to read between the lines what, what things mean. Yeah. So I think that's probably it for questions. Thank you so much for a really fascinating window of Alexandre de Bordeaux. And now let's do Prince. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.